Yeah. That's cool. So, um, yeah. I don't know if you've seen any of the of the other episodes, but what I just like to do is talk about what got you into music, get your thoughts on um, obviously the instrument you play, your influences growing up, songwriting, yeah. recording, gigging, all, all different bits and pieces. And obviously, we can ask the questions to everybody; they can all give their own thoughts because everyone's got a different opinion, which is what yeah, makes yeah. it interesting. Um, but what I like to do with everyone is go back to the very beginning. So for each of you, or the, or the ones that are here just now, where were you originally brought up? So um, we're, we're all from Melbourne in Australia. Yeah. Um, and uh, so like Phil I met when I was in early high school. So like year, year seven, year eight. Mm-hmm. Um, which I think is like form one, form two or whatever in, in secondary school sort of thing. So like 12 years old, we played in the table tennis team. And then, you know, he started, he was playing some guitar and I started learning a little bit of guitar, which was, and like, I assume by the way, which was the one question we didn't ask is that like, how did you get in contact with me? Was that because of the Pugwall TV show or? Yeah. So, so well, obviously yeah, I'm into music, I write music, record music, play live and it was one of those things that um, at work we were actually we were talking at work just about old TV programs you used to watch when you were a kid. Yeah, uh, and it, it's really weird because it, it was through through Pugwall, but I don't know what it was that in the UK you had to have been a certain age. So, so if you ask someone, do you remember the TV program Pugwall? You you only get two answers. One of them is, I remember it, I absolutely loved it, or I've never heard of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it just, I, I think it was shown, I think it was shown during the school summer holidays. Yeah. So you would wake up in the morning and I don't know if it was filmed, that they, they just done it over those six or seven weeks. I can't remember what it was, but um, but there was a thing came on and it, I think it was on YouTube and it was, what happened to the, the cast of Pugwall. It was like talking about old TV programmes. And there was yeah. lots of different ones. And the Pugwall one came up. Uh, this, this was a while ago. And obviously, yourself being the main character, um, it had said that you were obviously... I think you were playing in Bug Dust mm-hmm. at the time. And so Shan was in Bug Dust with me as well. So. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what kind of... I remember that you were playing the drums and then I think I'd seen something that you'd either worked in a recording studio, you were doing like a tour of a recording studio. Yeah, yeah, it's a YouTube video of like the intro of my, um, yes. like, I, mean, I did a promo for the um, for the recording studio and it's funny because a lot of people see that and, you know, I get a few pug wall type comments from that particular video, <laughs> which is weird because I've got like heaps of Pro Tools training videos and all sorts of other yeah. things online but it's always that video that people comment on yeah so it basically came from that so obviously kept it kept you in mind and the the podcast started last year and uh, season one was 30 guests so 30 episodes 30 guests i took a break and but this season two starts tonight the first episode comes out but this will be episode 18, I think, of season two. So probably won't be out on YouTube until August time. Okay. But I was obviously looking for guests. And season two, because season one kind of got it established, season two I've started to kind of get more people on that are from different backgrounds as well. So season one was just basically all musicians, all people playing in pubs. Season two I've had... It's the same thing, but there's also been um, well-known like radio presenters, TV presenters. Uh, I've had a couple of uh, people that appeared on, see, like your, like your, um, the Voice X Factor, like contestants like that. So yeah, yeah. you know, it's not really my thing, but they've they've got a different view. So it's always still interesting to hear. And then I thought you you would be a good one because you've got the recording studio part of it and you've also got the playing part of it as well hold on my sister's about to come in she, she likes her pug wall big fan <laughs> <laughs> we used to watch it as kids 
Like, oh, awesome. Must have, you were saying it's summer holidays. It must. Yeah. I, I, I don't remember. I'm but I remember all the songs. Maybe about 1990. Shaped my career. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. um, good luck with the the wedding. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank cheers. You. Yeah. See you later. Is that your way? Yeah. Well, sorry. Okay. Yeah. She's been sniffing about all day, waiting, waiting for me to speak to Pogwall. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, it's like you know, obviously that was thirty-five years ago or whatever, and it's um, it, it comes up less and less these days, but it still comes up every now and then. Where you yeah. know, like even even someone say at my work, well, you know, hear from someone else. So you know, J, JT was in Pogwall, and then they'll be like, "You were what? Oh my god." That, I, I love that show. And then, yep. literally, like you said, the next person will just be like, what are you talking about? Never heard of it, you know? Um, yeah, so, so that's kind of how it came about because I'm, I'm trying to get people, not just people playing in the pubs, I'm trying to get people from different backgrounds because um, they, they've got a different perspective on things. And, and I thought you would be a good one because you, you do the recording and the playing side of it as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so going back, so... so the band you are all originally from Melbourne. Yeah, so so we all yeah we're all from Melbourne. Um, so met Phil in year seven, year eight, playing yep. at table tennis. He was playing guitar. I was playing a bit of guitar. So we used to hang out and like listen to Queen and George Thorogood and all that sort of shit. Um, yeah, so we, we you know we we became fast friends, and then a, a, a little bit later in high school, like I'd started playing guitar in Pugwall. And so I wanted to play guitar in high school, um, you know, as my instrument in the music classes. And yeah, so yeah. I would started learning guitar. And now I'd, I'd played drums before Pugwall, but I sort of didn't care that much about drums once I started getting on guitar. And then this guy, this is one of my favorite stories, because he basically said, oh, um, I've seen you play drums in music class. You want to come along and have a jam with us and play drums? And I was like, yeah, okay, you know, so... I brought along another friend of mine, Dave, at the time and said, you know, like, we'll get Dave to play drums for you because, you know, I want to play guitar. And yeah. I've been learning um, Holy Wars by Megadeth, right? right. I've been yeah. trying to learn the riff, right? And I got it, like, to about half speed. Like, I could almost play it, but much slower. And then I went to this jam with Shan and I said, oh, man, yeah, I've been learning Holy Wars. And so he just started playing looking me in the eye, playing it at full speed, doing all the little vibrato bits and singing it at the same time. And I was just like, holy crap. Yeah. I'll play drums. What <laughs> was you're it? A freak. You know, he was a year younger than me in high school and he just blew my mind. I was like, okay, I'll play drums in a band with you because you're amazing and I'm shy. You know. Shannon, were you a better singer than Dave Mustaine? I don't think I was quite as nasally. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, Dave's a, he's a force unto himself. Oh, he? of course. Dane. Yeah. So, so obviously, see, when you, when you guys were younger growing up, were you exposed to music from a young age, maybe from like your parents playing music? So like, um, you know, because it was like mid, mid to late high school that um, I started playing with Shannon, but you know, at Phil's house, we would listen to heaps of Queen records and, you know, all sorts of different other bands, I guess, at the time. Guns N' Roses was a big one for us. We were yeah. absolutely obsessed with that Appetite for Destruction album. That changed my life. Yeah. That was the album that I just went, oh, my God, I, I'm addicted. This is music. I want to do this. Um, but Shan's dad, he played drums and still plays drums. He's like, what, 80, 80, 82 now. 82, yeah. and he still oh. plays drums with a band called Normie Rowe and the Playboys. And like, so he toured the world. Like they'd supported the Beatles. They'd like done so much stuff. So his influence, you know, like we would go and jam at Shannon's house. Yeah. And we just take over the lounge room and his dad had a PA and he'd come in and talk to me and the bass player in that band and go like your rhythm section your kick drum needs to go with that bass guitar you know yeah. like you need to lock in and and it was just a very free house a place that would highly support the music and we could make as much noise as we want and they they endorsed it they loved it so so jason yeah. you're saying you're saying appetite for destruction was a, a turning point for you it's, yeah. it's something that it, it, it sounds sounds silly but it changed your life it, it put you in a new a new path uh, that was the album for yourself what about yourself Shannon what was that was there an album for you that a light bulb went off in your head oh, I don't know I think I think I was lucky as JT was just saying that my my 
my family was had very open ears for music because it had been a part of their life. My mum was from the entertainment industry. My yep. dad was as well. His parents were Salvation Army musicians. My mum's grandparent, my mum's uh, parents were like uh, black and white minstrel entertainers. So there was a lot of music around growing up. There was a lot of jam sessions with my dad in the house, and I didn't really know what that meant. We just were just kids. But I think we were exposed to a lot of music. So I think um, something happened when I was probably about 14 or 15, or probably 12 or 13. I started hearing artists like Peter Gabriel and Sting and things and, and listening to the way my dad would listen to those songs and he'd point out little bits and pieces in the songs. Yeah. And from that, I started to realize that songs weren't just these things you listen to. They're, they're things you can break down the parts of and, and understand how they're made. And yeah. I think it was the light bulb moment was some of those artists and then I, I you know spent most of my teenage years as a little heavy metal fan with every single um, surface of my wall covered in Iron Maiden posters and things yeah. and, and and that's when JT and, and a bunch of us would just you know JT would be Guns N' Roses I'd be Iron Maiden Phil Phil might be Beastie Boys and Queen or something and our other friends yeah. might be in a different band and we all claimed our our, our favourite bands and um, and kind of were very loyal to that but uh, yep. at the same time we, we had very open ears and we're listening to lots of different stuff yeah like Living Colour was a big one for us yeah um, we were very united like all of us loved Living Colour so when we were first jamming we were doing Maiden tracks Living Colour like Slayer but then we might do you know I don't know more poppy stuff and we started a cover band for a while where we would just play like three hours of who knows what? Probably, probably yeah. the worst versions of covers that you could play. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. we were, you know, we were having a fun jamming and stuff with it. It, it, yeah. was, it, was, it was a good time. But I don't know if there's a pivotal album. I think it's just that light bulb moment when all of a sudden you hear music differently. Um, see, see if you if you think back, oh, it was a while ago now. But do you remember what the first album was that you ever bought with your own money? I do. Mine was the Rambo soundtrack. <laughs> Gary Goldsmith did the score and um, I don't know why but ended up buying the Rambo soundtrack I think I loved Rambo as a kid but uh, that's the first record that I had and it was breakdancing breakdancing records that had the posters in them that you could learn how to do the breakdancing steps from so that's my early memory of, of, of Electric buying Boogaloo records. yeah Breakdance 2 Electric, Electric Boogaloo, Boogaloo for Delaney he says yeah um, Beat Street and yeah. Rocksteady Crew and, like, and, <laughs> my first, I'm not quite sure what my first album was I think, I think I, I think it would have been the Beatles. The Beatles, okay, yeah. 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 So, like my my parents' influence because my my parents met and so I grew up very heavily around musical theatre, um, yeah. and that was sort of my you know thespian upbringing, you could say, and that's what got me into Pugwall. I acted in um, a, a couple of theatre shows with their theatre company, and someone in that theatre company said, "Hey, look, there's this." you know, TV show. And they, they'd been showing me a couple of chords on the guitar and they said, oh, there's this show going where they want someone your age who can play guitar. And, I, you know, I really couldn't. I knew like two chords or something. <laughs> um, so there was all that, you know, my, my dad was into Barry Manilow and Neil Diamond and that was about it. He never listened to him, but he had those records there, right? Yeah. So that was a really crap introduction to music. <laughs> um, but Dire Straits, Brothers in Arms was the first proper CD that I bought. Um, cause I think it was, you know, like with some money at that time I had, I was able to buy myself a Discman, a, a, a CD player. Now I had a few tapes and stuff, but that's the first album that I remember going, oh wow. And funnily this, enough, yeah. um, Brothers in Arms was the very first CD. The um, first digital, yeah. digitally recorded album, yeah. um, digitally mastered and then put on CD. Remember Which they used was? to have like ADD on them or DDD? Yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. So that was the first one of those, yeah. So um, what, so that was a big one for me, yeah. So Jason, you're obviously play, uh, were playing the drums to start yeah. with. Why did you pick the drums? Why not? Why did you not start on the guitar or the bass guitar or, or vocals? Um, so in early high school, um, I wanted to play saxophone, and I applied on you know on the school form to do saxophone. You know, like I filled out the form or whatever, and my mum forgot to hand it in. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, um, I didn't end up being able to play saxophone and my dad said he couldn't afford it. And I said, oh, no, look, seriously, we've, you know, like the school supplies the saxophone. He said, no, I can't afford the paddock to send you down the back off to play your bloody saxophone. Um, so he was taking the piss there. And then I was in a class and the teachers were um, basically asking us to run off and do some things. And um, 
I went out to out of the classroom. I came back into the classroom, and basically all the kids were like going me 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 me, and I was like, what did I miss out on? And they said, oh, there's drum lessons going. I was like, but you sent me out of the classroom. That's not fair. I, I wanted to play an instrument. I didn't get into sax. And so that's how I started playing drums. It was just right. missing out on a thing in school. And then I started playing drums. It was a complete accident. You know? what, about, what about yourself, Shannon, for guitar? What, why the guitar? I think it was probably the heavy metal music. Um, I, 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 you know, I think in woodwork class, I made the shape of James Hetfield's guitar. Yeah. Um, from, you know, that funny... Uh, Water. Shape that Destroyer. The destroyer shape. Um, Explorer. Explorer, yeah. that's it. Yeah. And um, and then a friend of mine, because I was running around my bedroom playing, you know, with a, yeah. a wooden piece of, uh, of a guitar shape, and then a friend had an old Ved Eddie Van Halen uh, cheap copy knockoff. It was a black guitar with all the white stripes on it, like yeah. an Eddie Van Halen style, and he sold that to me for $90 or something. And uh, that was the start of it for me. Instead of running around with a pretend guitar, I all of a sudden had a new one, and I would just take it everywhere, to the toilet, to bed, to the couch. I just would not put that thing down and just playing one finger on the strings at a time. Yeah, yeah. Thing just It started that way, and you know, plugging a guitar lead into the parents' stereo and almost destroying the speakers yeah. just to get some sort of sound. But it totally was just um, innocently... It started that way, and then um, then there were musicians in the house that could like teach me how to play a riff or something, or someone taught me how, they wrote out some tablature of some Metallica riffs or something, and it yeah. it just went on from there. Yeah. What, what about what about singing for yourself? Because as you see, with with the guitar or with drums, bass guitar, you can get other people to show you things to teach you, but when it comes to singing, singing's the one instrument that's different because. A huge part of singing is confidence. You, you can't teach someone confidence. You Sometimes it's whoever's bravest to step in front of the microphone because the band needs a singer. When did you start singing and, and how did you kind of get into that? Oh, look, I, you are 100% right. Confidence is a part of it. I don't think... I think we sang by default of not being able to find singers. So then you would sing and you knew that you weren't a great singer where we had big, you know, from Axl Rose through to all the big heavy metal singers and stuff. They were all great singers, but we needed some singing on our songs. So we ended up just doing it ourselves. Uh, I do remember sitting there one morning uh, on the guitar and tried singing whilst playing. It was chords and it was a, uh, and I was singing. I was like, Oh, I guess that's how it's done. But it, you know whether it sounded good was sort of uh, subjective. That was everyone else's problem. Uh, yeah. I think confidence is confidence is um, where it is. Once you start just feeling um, like you can enjoy singing and playing, then maybe it becomes something. But uh, look, that was probably about five or six. Probably the teenage years were probably horrible. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not saying it's not saying it's great now. Like I think there are there are people that can sing and there are people that have great voices. So I think you know. It's funny when you say that though, because because you look at James Hetfield, you know what? Probably one of the top three biggest names in rock when it comes to singing. But you hear him live, even during the Master of Puppets tour, he's still not found his voice. It wasn't until the end of the eighties and Justice for All that he's he found his voice. It started to come through. I still don't think he was confident even up to the Black Album. Absolutely, I, and I don't think the thrash metal bands from that time um, were all about being great singers because the music was so high octane. Anthrax and Slayer and Megadeth—they weren't great singers, but they had a distinct something. I think James Hetfield, you're 100 percent right. He's still finding his voice even to, to today. You you notice he sings a lot more on recent tours, and he actually puts in a lot more melodic yeah. uh, influence into what he's doing now. Because I think all his life he's tried, probably wanted to be a great singer and needed to just put the time in for it. Um, yeah. But he's a good example. He's not necessarily a great singer, but he is the voice of Metallica. So it, it becomes yeah. what it becomes. Yeah. So tell us about the band Mono Deluxe. What, did it start, in, was that in high school? Or was it, when did the band actually begin? I'll get this one. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Andrew right. step yeah. in. because we'll it's sort of, it's sort of, yeah, yeah. It sort of started with two of us and he, he can kick it off. Yeah. Um, so, Shan and I were in Japan, uh, in Tokyo, at, a, at a, a friend's 40th birthday party, Mark Rochford, who's also a great uh, musician and, and songwriter. And um, we were over there having a bit of fun, and Shan and I had met a couple of times, and I knew that he was a muso, and 
I've been sort of knocking around with bands for a while. I, was, I had a I had a new lease on life in terms of, um, and I had an idea and a concept of what I wanted to uh, to do because I'd met Shan and worked out that his style of playing and the influences that we both had were very similar and the, the just the the artistic part of what could be possible in a band. And we're, th- we're talking about you know, uh, um, hopefully our songwriting will be good. Uh, yeah. So we know how, as Shannon, who's a finished artist, uh, has a, a great understanding of style and how we can appear on stage. I was I work with this band, Black Cab, doing their lighting and all their visuals. Uh, they're a cult band and they're known for their lighting and their visuals. So I thought, well, visually, we can do something that's going to be enjoyable for people in the audience. So there's more than just about making music for yourself. Any fuckhead can do that. But trying to be entertaining and um, like give something to the audience was yeah. just where it kind of started, the idea anyway. So we got together uh, for a jam and I think we wrote a song right there, like with the first two chords I started playing on the bass, we wrote a song straight away right. and it was still um, part of our set. Um, so it was a very instantaneous sort of thing so, and, and we kind of just looked at each other and went, all right, that felt pretty good right off the, the, right, right from the get-go. Yeah. And we had a friend of, of, of mine uh, working with us on drums, and then uh, he was just a fill-in, really, I guess. And when, I guess, Shan and I decided to keep pushing forward, we're writing more songs. Um, we had this conceptual idea that we were going to be uncle, and we'd write all the music, and then we'd get all these guest um, sort of uh, artists to come and sing our songs for us. Um, so we had these sort of ideas, uh, and we were coming a bit more of a technical band as well, from, from a musical production point of view, especially playing live. And what we needed to, for that to be ongoing, Shan understood that we needed to get JT involved because Jace is a very uh, accomplished nerd and, uh, and knew how to keep us all in line um, physically, musically. So, um, and, and as soon as Jace dropped in, it was, again, because these guys have been playing for so long, it was like, uh, it's like a pair of your favourite slippers were on. Yeah. And all of a sudden, everything just locked into place beautifully. And Jace has been a really big part of, of um, you know, I guess Shannon and I write most of the riffs and the songs, but we can't really do it without having Jace's prowess mm-hmm. and understanding of rhythms um, that just works so well for us. And again... Well, here's a, here's a question then for you, right? So what do you think makes a band work? And, and I don't mean in terms of success, but what makes a, a band work as in... What you find with most bands is they have a leader. And I don't mean someone dictating this is what you do, but generally there's, got, there's usually someone steering the ship with the, and the other guys trust that person to get behind them and go on the journey. What do you think makes a... Does a band need a leader? Yeah, it does. I pretty much, like, put the rocket under these guys. Uh, otherwise, nothing will really happen. Um, but <laughs> saying that, nothing can happen without them. You know what I mean? Like, it's... Yeah. Uh, and then, and then it's, but as soon as they're there, like, it's, it's all there. I think, I think another, in, in addition to what Andrew's saying there, I think it actually, what makes a band... You said it's not about the. It's actually about the way that they can work together using the strengths of um, of the. Yeah. There's three of us in Mono Deluxe. Um, Andrew, I, you know, he will keep the train moving. Yeah. Um, I might be able to um, help keep like the creative eye ideas kind of uh, coming out, and JT helps um, bring Stitch that to life and make it yeah. possible. So yeah. there's three really strong independent skill sets there there's that went that went, that it, it wouldn't really work if we all weren't contributing. That, that muscle that we've yeah. all got. Uh, so it sounds very much like that there is the three of you, but each person trusts the other person is capable of doing what is required to make the overall thing sound better. There's, there's no real, like, no one's, like, making the big calls in this band. Um, someone will have an idea and everyone will agree or they won't. Nine out of ten times, though, we're pretty much going, yeah, that's a great idea, let's do that. Yeah. Um, so... And, and I think we're only just really scratching the surface of what the potential is in this band. Um, because we're all producers and we, are, we all work in professional fields, it's very hard for us to, to get together a lot to um, 
do a lot more but I think it's that and what we know is especially you know when we sort of sit down I'll go around to Shan's place because I've got this riff that's just been rolling around my head for ages and I have to get it out um, and then Shan will take it and go hey I've got this really great idea we can morph into this that and the other mm-hmm. um, and that becomes a completely different uh, beast on itself and then you know and then you know we, we kind of put that in the bank for later yeah um, but yeah there's when uh, Someone needs to keep the, the show rolling. I do that. Shan comes in with a lot of the of, of the ideas in terms of the styling, I guess, in terms of the, some of these songs and some really great ideas. Well, I was going, I was going to ask, what's the band's songwriting process? So, do you have like a Shan in the main songwriter? Look, I think there's um, there's there's a few different ways bands can work. Um, sometimes it's improvisational in the the moment, in the energy, yeah. the energy at the moment. Jump on in, JT. Um, sometimes it's kind of the spur of the moment stuff. Other times someone will bring an idea, and there's been uh, there's other times where I've I've sat at two o'clock in the morning on a Friday night after a busy week of of normal adult job or something, yeah. and um and you would come up with something, and I might kind of build something electronic or whatever, and then we kind of go, guys, let's let's turn that into one of our songs. <laughs> And we, yeah. we get into a room and we grab some of the parts of the electronic elements or something that are on what I made at two o'clock in the morning. And now JT can be making sure that that is being represented in the rehearsal room or on stage. Um, and then we, you know, translate across the bass parts and vocal parts and things like that. So sometimes it's um, improvisational, sometimes it's planned and other times it's, it's taking something and try to figure out how we can turn that into a band version. And do, does the band have a preferred method for recording so for example a lot of this maybe depends on style as well but some bands like to record the rhythm section live in the studio others will they'll build it so they'll do the drums first bass guitars vocals yeah, is it a preferred way so very much um you know I've, I've obviously done quite a lot of recording over the years um for a band like this it, it's very much a case of uh a lot, a lot of the stuff that Shan writes when he first comes up with ideas, even w- whether it's with Delaney or not, um, is built in Pro Tools. And so he'll be at home doing that in Pro Tools. Mm-hmm. And then we'll get those tracks. And when we perform live, I'll pull them into Ableton and use that. But um, we're very heavy Pro Tools users. So we'll basically get that bed of the track. And then we'll get the drums in, we'll edit them, make them perfect. Then we'll start layering all the parts on top of that and then refine everything. So it's usually one part at a time and build it. We have done some stuff live in the studio, um, at least to get the ideas down, but yeah. we're usually over, overdubbing that afterwards and making sure every note's perfect and all yeah. that. I mean, I was listening to some of your stuff and uh, what I like about it, and you mentioned this earlier, the, the, the drums and the bass are f- form a unit and it allows Shannon, Shannon's guitar to float along the top. But, but what Shannon does on the guitar is you don't overload it. So you, you give the song time to breathe. You know, it's not, it's not every second doesn't have to have a, a guitar note in it. There's, there's spaces which lets the song breathe. So it, it's really nice to hear. But it sounds, when I was listening to it, it felt like almost that like you took the feel of the 80s, but you've brought it into the new age. Yeah, I, look, for starters, I'm going to say it's quite interesting you say that Shan leaves space in the music. That's, yeah, that's, bullshit. That's, yeah. <laughs> There's a fair bit, yeah, these guys are laughing because there's always way too much guitar, but I think in what you're talking about, the recordings and stuff, uh, it's about having the right parts for the song. So yeah. sometimes there's like little looping guitar parts underneath it, but they're not, they're not yeah. trying to... To, to distract or something but I do think you're right there I think there's the 80s the, the melancholy of the 80s music with all of its little synthesizer lines whether it's Depeche Mode or um, you know other other artists from that kind of era that you know could make a riff out it could, it could be a guitar riff or it could be a synthesizer riff we were certainly weren't scared to bring that in there Phil Phil, who has been a part of making music with us forever, we um, we were always into technology, synthesizer parts, um, having things go through delay pedals so that we could make things sound a little bit strange yeah. and unusual. Um, so I guess that probably does stem from the bands that pioneered all that, which probably does come from the 70s and 80s where they're bringing yeah. in unusual well, sounds. Here's another question then, and, and this will be from a musician point of view and recording engineer point of view. So... I'm also in my 40s, but we've obviously grew up in a similar time where when you were younger, 
you would go to the music shop and you'd be flicking through the CDs and then, um, you know, you you could purchase an album having never heard it before. So you you could potentially purchase an album based on the cover artwork. Yes. Because you go, that, that looks cool. I want to buy that. You take it home and then you hope that it's maybe, it's got, it's got some good tunes on it as well. Nowadays, the way that music is accessed, you know, you've got streaming, you've got downloading. Is artwork still important? Well, I, I definitely think it is. I'm a graphic artist as well. I've, I've made a lot of artwork for, for album covers. And look, I talked about the heavy metal teenage years. Stare, sitting back and listening to an Iron Maiden record while you stared at that complex artwork and noticed little details, that's something yeah. that I'll never forget. Associating the artwork to a record. It is a bit of a lost art these days when you're looking at a Spotify square on a screen. Um, you don't get a chance to sit there and really associate a great piece of artwork with the music so it definitely as it definitely as a lost art i had someone on the podcast a few episodes ago and they were actually the same age as my daughter and and it blew my mind because when i asked the person uh, about the first album they ever bought they've never bought an album and, and I was just like, yeah. it, it blows my mind. Now, they love music just as much as I love music, but they've just been brought up in a different time. But to me, making an album, you know, you had the songs, but you also had to think about the, the order. You couldn't just write 10 songs and put the 10 songs out. It's got to start with this song. It's got to lead into this song. It's definitely got to end on this song. You've got the artwork. You've got the booklet inside that gives all the lyrics and details. And also back when we were younger, if you had 10 albums at home, you would know the 10 albums inside out because you, you didn't have unlimited choice. So you, you studied those 10 albums, whereas it just doesn't happen nowadays. And it, it's a different generation. It's not right. It's not wrong. But... It just blew my mind that someone younger who's in, so into music had never purchased an album. But it's just the way it goes. I've noticed it with friends that are our age that have got uh, kids that might be 19, 20, 21. Yeah. Um, they hardly even listen to the song all the way through. Yeah. And I don't mean to be ageist or generalised there. but I've, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I've seen them at, at a party when they're playing a song. They, they get the first verse and chorus out and then they skip to the next thing and um, they, they might be missing out on the greatest outro in a song that, yeah. that they, haven't, they haven't stuck around to do. So, uh, uh, look, there's a reason why I think vinyl is really popular. Yeah. Um, uh, it's really popular in sales these days. That's probably where we all feel a little bit older because there's something about dropping that needle it means you just don't skip, right? You kind of yeah, you follow the story that you've been, you know, or that the album's given you. JT in, uh, and I in Bug Dust, even for making a CD, you would still think about it inside A and side two. Yeah. Um, okay, the first five songs we want to finish the first half of the record off with a certain type of song that might be a bit more artistic or whatever, and then we want to start the second half of the record off with a certain story as well, and that's all inbred from um, the vinyl. Yeah. Well, here, here's here's a question then, and this, I mean, it's for everyone. Jason, you might have your own thoughts, but being the owner of a recording studio or having worked around one for the last twenty odd years. So when you look at the the old bands, see the bands from the 60s, like the Beatles, the Stones, the Doors, the Who, all these great, great bands. They were using extremely primitive recording equipment to record these amazing albums, right? Now, when you compare that recording gear to what's available today, it's like night and day, but... The gear that they were using was so primitive, it, it almost forced the bands into being as um, creative as possible. Nowadays, when you're seeing other bands recording, because the recording gear is so... It's limitless what you can do with it. Does that make some bands less creative as a result? I, I think it, it just changes the, the type of creativity... Um, I, I don't think it stops it. I think some people might get a little bit slack and complacent with it. Even, you know, when you watch that Foo Fighters documentary and they did the recording with yeah. 
to that, tape with Butch Vig and it's like um, the Sound City one yeah no not the Sound City one it's the where they did they basically did an album to tape yep. to sort of you know instead of yeah, um, yeah. doing it in Pro Tools and you know and the the, bas- the musicians are basically saying oh god I had to actually learn my parts you yeah. know and it's a different thing and it's like you know like I can edit like a fiend in Pro Tools and I can do what I call polishing turds you know make a drummer sound good yeah. make a singer sound good and stuff um, in the old days, you had to be good, you know, like you didn't have a choice. You, you weren't able to pitch correct and, you know, time align drums and do all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, you, you, yeah. Hear, you hear the doors playing <clears throat> the woman, that's, that's them in the studio, mic'd up, playing it live in the studio. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, that would be to a click track and, it, you know, it would, would it sound better? I don't, I don't know. Maybe there would be something missing. Yeah, and look, you know, to me, I, I, you know, like you said before, it's not right, it's not wrong. I like things when they're in time, you know. I spent, I did 10,000 hours minimum trying to be in, an in-time drummer. You know, I like things to be in time. And if I want a song that has a bit of a, a lift in it and a bit of a grow and a bit of a tempo change or something like that, mm-hmm. I'll tempo map that into Pro Tools, you know. Like, yeah. I want that deliberately in there. And I still think that's a great thing. But, you know, I recorded a band a few weeks ago and they came in and man, click track wasn't for them and they had this real sludgy, like, laid back thing going on. Yeah. And so basically I, you know, was just like, no, no click track. You guys are just going to do your thing. And they did a take and it was like, oh, we started rushing a bit and they did another one and they finally settled. And, you know, that sort of um, natural vibe and that feeling of yeah. like it's going to tape was completely fine, yeah. you know? It depends on the band. You know, I like a lot of really neat, accurate stuff. I think it adds a lot of power to the music, you know? And sure, in the old days, I think that power came from the musicians actually being good and playing together, hearing each other, being well rehearsed and all that. These days, you can do it in Pro Tools, you know? there's There's a lot to be said about character and personality as well. I think a lot of the classic older bands, Rolling Stones or even soul singers, Marvin Gaye and things, there, there'll be accidents in, the, in those recordings that these days they would totally fix. Yep. Actually, um, they are actually the things that make the character of it too. So there has to be a fine, it's a, it, it's a personal thing for different artists, but there has to be that, I don't think you want to go so perfect that you lose soul and, and feeling and yep. character, uh, but at the same time, um, you have that ability now to maybe they wanted that to be in time, but they, you know, something yeah. happened on the day and it became a little bit, um, you know, fell off the rails a bit. But look, I don't think we look back at some of those songs and, and don't like them because there was a little slip up in a vocal or a, or, or a, a missed snare or something um, that just adds kind of character. I, what, what do we call it? Um, the perfection of imperfection. Yeah. Like it's I like to- Imperfect, you know. I, I like to try and do both. So I, I like to have the drums a hundred percent spot on to a click track, but I like everybody else to then. I, I, I don't like the guitarist to record a verse and then copy and paste. I like them to play it start to finish. So you yeah. ki- you're kind of trying to maybe find the middle ground there. And as I say, that there is no right or wrong. It, it depends, and a lot of it also depends on the style of music. That, that you're um, that you're playing, but here's a question for all three of you. Then, imagine you could only write and record, or perform live for the rest of your days. Which one would you pick? Write and record. Yeah, yeah. Every time. Yeah. Um, that's 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 the the playing live is because of what you do. Yeah. In, in your in your little room. Um, Jack White talk, sung about it. Um, when you're in your little room and you're thinking of something big, and then when you get something big, they move you to a bigger room. And I think that's kind of, and then, you, then the, the song finishes off by him saying, you know, once you're in that bigger room, then you kind of forgot why you're there in the first place, so you go back to your little room again. Right. And that's the thing, right? So you always get back to your little room to, to make and be creative and, and, and do all these things. I just want to take a step backwards so the last question you had, I completely disagree with both of these guys uh, when it comes to production. I think that the last 20 years has been pretty, pretty muzaki 
Um, and I think it's all down because of digital um, pro tools and things like that. It's a really clever platform. It does a lot. It does too fucking much though. And what you were talking about earlier in the 60s where they had to get creative because they needed to make these noises. They had to find these accidents and find yeah. this sound. They had to find their own sounds. Whereas right now, everyone's using the same sound, the same <laughs> plugins. Everything's way too polished. And yep. it's, you know, there's some good stuff there, obviously. I'm not saying it's all shit, but um, I'm not saying any of it's shit. It's just, it's just a certain style. And I think it's just, um, it's quite a coincidence also that ever since Pro Tools came out and people have been leaning on that to make the sound for themselves, there doesn't seem to be any tribes anymore. You know, like we're sort of talking about through the, through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 90s was the way it sort of started to wane off a bit. There were these tribes, there were goths, there were punks, there were skinheads, there were rasters, there were all these things, right? Yeah. Name the last, you know, 20 years where there's been new tribes. Yeah. Yeah, you really can, you know. So... Apart from, apart from hip-hop, maybe, yeah. Well, that's hip-hop was always there in the 80s, right? But so it's, that's... It's, it's day, though, you know, you had rock and roll in the 50s, 60s, you had a lot of... Drugs being consumed, new new sounds being created that carried on into the 70s. You had punk, you had disco. The 80s, you had a, a, a new sound with uh, electronics. Uh, the 90s, you had obviously grunge, you had new metal. You had new sounds being created that hadn't been done before. And I don't know if it's me getting old, but I kind of feel by the time 2000 came around, that most new new sounds had already been done. Not that's not to say that there's not great music still being created, but I don't hear anything that I've not already heard before in regard to the way it actually sounds. I think it's interesting that um, like dubstep kind of came out of two thousand, um, where that really sort of overdriven electronic music. But what's interesting now is that jazz made a comeback. Um, and again, that was kind of like, you know, we're sort of talking about early jazz types. It was, um, you know, if you, you go listen to early jazz trumpeting, for example, and obviously we're talking about Coltrane, fuck, all of a sudden now we're talking about fucking Coltrane. But, um, you know, like, but that's the thing, like, and he's a wild, he was a wild player. Like, it was, it was pretty out of the box sort of stuff. So I guess right now jazz is finding its renaissance because everything out there, this is just my personal take on it, Everything else, there needs to be some more boundaries pushed. And I think going jazz can sort of really do that mm. um, and to find out where we get to the next stepping stone, potentially. Maybe that's how, that's my idea of it anyway. So we're obviously halfway through 2024. We've got a wedding coming up, but apart from the wedding, what is the plans for the rest of the year? <laughs> okay, so yeah, our, our plans is... Uh, to finish this album that we've been working on for about uh, 416 years now. Um, yep. So, you know, like we, we've got that, that single that's out um, with Kylie Aldis, which is great. You know, we did that one song that was good. We did the um, Live at the Warehouse stuff, which is out. Um, you know, that was great. That was awesome. Uh, but we've been, you know, producing and working on these new songs. There's about four or five of them that are basically ready but we want to do a full album like you were talking about before, that idea of, you know, we want to think of it like a vinyl and we love albums. Personally, I almost never have just a song in my library sort of a thing. It's always about the album for me. So um, I basically put a bit of a, a block on us doing gigs. We were doing some great gigs and everything was good, but I was like, we need to finish this album. We need to have a product. We need to get that done. And because we're all so busy, like, you know, Delaney's like the director of an AV company, Shen's the lead graphic artist at a game place, you know, I run a degree in audio engine. We are busy bastards. Yeah, yeah. We just, you know, and, and it's not like a, a mad rush for us. We're just a bit slack and it's taken a long time. So. We, we did lock ourselves in, in a barn, in this old um, update, upgraded barn uh, in a country town uh, in October last year to finish all the songs off as in recording them um so we've, we've done that so we're halfway there um we're just we're doing two different versions of this yeah this, this is something for you so i'm currently putting my spit on how i think the songs should sound so shen and i have differences i guess in terms of how we think the songs should sound but i think what we get well not, it's not really like that um feels like putting his fists up it's, it's not even close 
but like well, I, I, I come from a more sort of like a, a gothy um, indie. In, indie kind of angle a bit more grit um, Shan's a bit more polished and comes from a bit more, has more pop sensibilities and I think that between the two of us we'll find that happy medium with these songs yeah. uh, as, as a finished product um, but for right now I think it's what's going to happen is that I'll do my version then uh, one or two things that'll be the version or Shen will do his version and then we'll spend more time trying to work out what it's going to look, look like in I, the think, I think we're all happy as long as we're forward momentum yeah yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah. and like so you know when Delaney's saying his version from that production side of thing that means coming around to my place and him you know, me sitting there with Pro Tools and basically he'll be like, all right, take this part out here, make that louder, do this, let's put some effects on this. And so I'll sit there and edit and mix and so on. More of and me. Then, yeah. And, you know, as usual, <laughs> the bass player is saying, turn me up, turn me up. Yeah. So I'll probably reach for the sub in the room or something. But um, I'll say, sit over there. It's a really strong bass, you know, yeah. uh, zone in the, in the room. But And then Chan will come in and do his bits. You know, we sort of do a bit of back and forth like that until... Yeah, and then sometimes when they leave, I might go in and, you know, fine-tune things and fine-tune the mastering and everything and go, all right, that's that's where these tracks yep. are at. So there's a few of them that we're all basically happy with and a few that still need some work before we can get this album up and ready to go. So, so up to this point, we have been extremely serious with lots of technical music questions for any musicians that are watching. So I like to end things on some fun questions. Sure. All right, so... These are all Aussies, and I've, I've had other Aussie bands on, some that, that you probably might know. So I've had the Duke Cartel guys on. Yep. I had Al Alcatomic guys. I've had um, one of the guys that was on the, the programme Home and Away, and he, oh, yeah. he moved to LA to, to, to do music. So, two Aussie legends. You've got Alf Stewart from Home and Away, <laughs> and you've got Mick Dundee from uh, Killing Crocodiles. Who would win in a fight to the death? Oh. Well, Mick Dundee's going to bring a knife. Yeah, Mick, Mick Dundee is going to bring a knife. But, and he's going to go, but, that's not a knife. You know, like. But the argument was, Mick Dundee's got a knife. What does Alf Stewart have in his tackle box? Uh, a, a propensity to just give you the shits. He's a, he's a walking diuretic. <laughs> I I think that basically Alf Stewart. Yeah, it's time for you to take a seat. I think, he's yeah. going to totally lose it because you just can't win a knife fight with saying flaming, flaming, flaming oh, all the time. Yeah, crack of the whip. Oh, also. flaming, <laughs> flaming. Alf, you can't do that. So Truth. Alf's got nothing. No, that's fine. Next question, again, this is for everybody. So imagine you've got a time machine. Imagine you could go back in time, anywhere in the world, big concert, small gig. What's the one that you wish you could have attended to actually see? Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Any Led Zeppelin gig would be. Yeah. I, I never got a chance to see John Bonham. I would have loved to have seen, you know, any any Led Zepp show. Yeah. What about for everyone else? Uh, probably, I would have loved to have seen Frank Zappa, uh, yep. probably in the late 80s, around the You Are What You Is kind of era. It was just phenomenal. Um, but Frank Zappa is definitely one of uh, one of those. And I know, obviously, we'll never see him. Yeah. Because he passed away in 95. And it's, yeah, uh, we've seen some, we've all seen some amazing artists because of our age. I'm sure you're the same. Yeah. We, you know, you, know, you talk to younger people. Um, we saw that some of those bands you know, when they were actually in their prime. Yeah. So we're all lucky to have seen people like Jeff Buckley and Nirvana and different bands like that. So, uh, but if there's a bit of a, a wish list, Frank's happy for me. Trell? Um, uh, it's a good question. You know what? I'd probably go and see a band called Morphine oh, yeah. in some small smoky club in Boston. That would be my... Okay. I see. Yeah. Right. I want to say the Spike Island gig with the Stone Roses played many years ago. Right, okay. Um, oh, yes, famous gig. Uh, famous gig. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I'd say that rooftop gig the Beatles did at Apple Core, oh, yeah. that'd have to be the one for me, I reckon. If you could, if you could perch yourself on a windowsill somewhere yeah, and watch yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be cool. 
Right, for each of you, you've obviously all got your, your chosen instrument. Um, Jason, you, you'd already said you'd love to have played sax, but is there another instrument you wish you could play? Piano, absolutely. And, and seriously, that, that wish to want to play saxophone was probably about 20 minutes of my life when I was 11. That was it the um, Lost Boys, that guy with the big muscles? I don't know. Like, I'm almost embarrassed that I've ever said that because, uh, um, you know, my, my, my youngest brother ended up playing saxophone. Like, he played in the Olympic opening ceremony. He played baritone sax and stuff. And I was very glad to let him have that, that mantle. But for me, piano. I think piano is, like, the instrument. And I think if I'd learned it, all of the musical theory and all the stuff that goes with piano, I think that would have made me a different player, you know. Yeah. What about for the other guys? No. Um, still, Phil's a guitarist. Still he's, plays, he's, still plays a few things. He's yeah. left-handed, so maybe he just wishes he played right. No. <laughs> um, you know, I know this probably sounds strange, and this is only very recently, but a lap steel? Yeah. I would love to be able to play a fucking lap steel well. Yeah. Um... There's something about him, but I don't know, I think. Luke, yeah. I've, I've always really envied a person who can sit down on a piano or a keyboard yeah. and play with personality or with sense of humour or, or just know the right part. I know I've worked with musicians in, uh, who are like that, and um, when you sit there, when they can sit on a piano and just absolutely mm -hmm. effortlessly make it sing, and I look at their fingers and their coordination, uh, that would be, um, it'd be, if I could insert a chip at the back of the neck, um, like in the Matrix, um, yeah, it'd yeah. be great to insert, you know, piano skills. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How about you, Andrew? Um, part of the reason I wanted to play with Shane is because I really like his guitar playing. Um, he goes everywhere around that neck that I want to be able to do as a guitar player. Um, I started, I've been playing bass for a little while. I started off as a guitarist. But um, yeah, like, like JT pointed out, when you're... Um, when you sit next to someone in a room who can just shred and play as heavy and as light as you can, I've always loved that about guitarists. And I can do it to a degree, but I can't shred the way Shan can. Yeah. And um, and understand what those um, those sensibilities are about being a guitarist. I'd like to be able to have that. Cool. Another okay. question. What about yourself? Yeah, what about well, you? I, I play guitar and, and uh, guitar and sing. It would have to be piano as well. There's just something about. Um, I, I like see, see like boogie boogie piano and you see someone that can do that properly but it's just it's just great to sit and, sit and hear and uh, hearing someone just sit down and play the piano is different from someone sitting playing the guitar it just I don't know what it is it just sounds great here's another question then as you all know there's millions of amazing songs that have been recorded over the years What's the one song for each of you that you wish you could have been in the recording studio behind the mixing desk to watch it being recorded? Oh, God, I can't answer that. Well, I felt like we were so lucky recently to watch that Let It Be, <clears throat> Peter Jackson yeah. remastered, what was it, six hours of the Beatles? Like, yeah. that was kind of a, an insight. We probably all thought, you know, how did the Beatles do this? And that, so that was really amazing. Um, I, I'm a massive Prince fan. I think... Um, I think being a fly on the wall watching uh, watching Prince build things um, would, would have been amazing, whether it's him by himself or whether the way he commanded his musicians. Um, yeah, I, I think I would love to have been just inside of those moments and just mm -hmm. the energy must have just been thrilling. So I would say anything to do with Prince or, you know, cl claiming and pretending it's me or being you know, a fly on the wall. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with a whole session and we spoke about it last night because we heard um, we were at a bar last night and we heard Queens of the Stone Age um, that's, oh, yeah. so, that's Songs for the Death I think with Grohl on drums and what he brings to a production um, um, mentality I think being in that recording session of that, of that album yeah. hearing one song after the next and they would have been having a bit of fun at the same time um, especially back then coming out of Caius and these sort of things and really sort of building off this momentum that would have been a time that's a strong that, energy that, that would have been a time yeah yep. and with um, Dave Grohl recording for some of those songs yeah. Dave, Dave Grohl recorded the drums and the cymbals separately right yeah. and that that stuff is freaky right you know that just shows another level of how amazing Dave Grohl is mm. um Oh, I, I can't. I can't think of anything 
like specific because I'm an engineer generally and I every time I listen to something I go fuck what would it be like to be in the studio so nearly everything that I love but if there was an I could just say an album Joni Mitchell's Hiera Hiera with Yako with Yako yeah Jacko with Jacko yeah yeah. Yako Pistorius and um that uh, that album just fucking melts me every time and uh just to be around watching that, then put that together. But the other thing I was going to say is, I've always loved long, epic tunes. And if there's one song that I would have loved, it would have been Coma, Guns N' Roses, Use Your Illusion 1, I think it was on. It's like a 10 minute track. I, when that, when I first heard that, I was like, yeah. oh my God, I fucking love. I just love how, you know, somebody can arrange something over such a long time and tell a story and it's still all this, you know, connected tune and whatever. So, yeah, that's my off the wall choice. Okay, mine's gonna be um, Third Eye by Tool. Right. Okay. Yeah, from the last song on the Arnhem album. Yeah. All right. I, I just would have loved to have been there to watch Danny Carey do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Here's, here's another one for the four of you in the room, and there might end up being. I don't want anyone falling out. <laughs> right. But each of you, imagine you've got, it's four o'clock in the morning, you've got a dead body in the boot of your car, you need to dispose of this body, no questions asked. Don't, don't need to imagine that one. How did you know? How did you know? <laughs> He's on to us. There's a reason we're not here. Yeah. For each of you, who are you phoning at four o'clock in the morning to help, to help you dispose of the body? Delaney. <laughs> <laughs> like immediately, yeah. Is that everyone? He doesn't mind getting his hands dirty. He does. He'll, he'll reach out and do whatever he can for his mates. If yeah. we, if we had um, three dead people in our kitchen, because we, we actually had two earlier, but Andrew is taking care of that for us. So I think, uh, well, I agree, Andrew. Yeah, that's quite normal for Glasgow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, was, it was only his first night here, so yeah. you know we'll see. We'll see how night two goes. <laughs> Does it have to be a real person or not? Because Mr. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, the wolf. Yeah. yeah. If you the can't wolf, yeah. if you can't get him, I'd choose Will. Mm. We all know Will. Will's an old friend of mine. If I, Will, Will, there's a dead body. He'd be like, cool, all right. What do you need? <laughs> Really, really the, only, the only problem with, like, you know, another reason I'd choose Delaney is he'd be able to help lift it. Where I don't know how well. <laughs> no, no. Will, I don't think Will would be. Will might, we might bring a fork thing. Yeah. And, you know, but to, he's, he's, he's got a business mind, so he might just dissect. Dissect the point, and, actually. Into liftable portions. He'd probably <laughs> just um, <laughs> talk to you about work while he's, you know, yeah. sawing up the, you know, legs off, they're the heavy parts, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Someone, someone, had, someone had suggested, depending on, if for those that are 40 years and older, it would probably come down to who would be more likely to pick up the phone at four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. It's a good yeah. point, actually. Yeah. Two more questions, then. I better ask this one for my, for, for my sister that was on earlier. Do you keep in touch with the Pugwall um, members? The cast? Um, so, some of them, yes. Um... I mean, it was so long ago. Yeah, yeah. But so, so Ricky Fleming, who played String Bean. Shout um, out to Ricky. Yeah. Absolute friggin' legend. Love that guy. Um, we've been friends ever since the show, like the whole way through. You know, we've, there's periods where we don't see each other and stuff. Like he's touring the world um, with his kids at the moment who are racing mo- motorbikes, like, you know, proper, you know, 250, 500cc motorcycles and stuff. And... You know, the first time I went to his house during the pug world time, he picked me up from the station in his mum's V8. He was 13, right? <laughs> Drove me home, we got on a 500cc bike and we're doing like 240Ks down the freeway riding around because no one can tell when you're wearing that. We got back to his house, his mum was upset at us because we forgot to get the beers. So we jumped back in the car and went through the drive through to get the, like that was the 13 year old Ricky Fleming, you know, it was absolutely insane fun. Um, really good friends with him. The director of Pugwall, John Gatchi, died about five, six years ago. And so most of us went to the funeral for that. So that was me, Jay McCormack, Rebecca Blomberg, 
um, and Ricky Fleming and uh, Mar Marcella as well, who played Daniela in the show. So the five of us all caught up then and then we've caught up a few times since then. Um, we never really caught up much with Troy and Troy passed away actually just recently. So um, the guy who played Bazaar. Yeah, that's, that was a pretty sad story. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, last question f for all of you. Who is your Mount Rushmore for whether it be bands, musicians, who are the four bands or musicians for your, yourself are at the top of the pile? JT is one of them for me. <laughs> Phil, JT, Andrew. Yeah, that's easy. So, Phil's so, Phil so honoured to have had the musicians that I played with um, and still are still playing with. So I think really the, the real heroes are the close ones. The big fantastical ones for me are, you know, Prince and the Beatles and Frank Zappa and whatnot. But um, I, I, I love just being in awe of the people that are in the in the room or on the stage. That's yeah, great. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a suck up answer, but it's no, I'm it's, but, it, but it's true as well. <laughs> so that's um, that's my corny answer. Yeah, I, I like your answer too, Shan. Um, I'm gonna go with the Sex Pistols. Um, obviously were amazing. David Bowie is probably the biggest one. Uh, Nirvana, because again, they were kind of like as impacting as what the Sex Pistols were, where Nirvana pretty much changed the course of pop music. It yeah. obliterated everything from the 80s. If you were an 80s artist, Nirvana came in and made you redundant <laughs> overnight. Um, and yeah, I have to go with the Beatles Stones. Um, yeah, that's kind of where I get my go-tos. What be the other? Yeah, I'm just going with Stan. Yeah. <laughs> the people I play with, you know. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm with that. Sure, I love, um, you know, like Dave Grohl's a freak to me, but so is Prince, so is a lot of those people. But, you know, I get most of my musical joy playing music with these people, you know. Like, we're, th there's a reason the four of us are here in Glasgow right now is because, you know, we've been doing this since we are kids, you know, so, yeah. I thought it was because you were getting married. <laughs> yeah, there's that. There's the reason they're here before <laughs> my wedding. That's, exactly. what, we, that's yeah, what we yeah, tell yeah. JT's future wife. <laughs> yeah, the reason we're here is because, you know, my wife is from Glasgow, but, um, yeah, there's a reason these guys have come because, you know, we've shared all the, all the music together, you know, the studio time, the gigs, the, you know, listening to music all our lives, etc. so, yeah. yeah. Hey guys, thank you for giving me an hour out of your day to sit and talk absolute nonsense about music and uh, everything else that goes with it. It's been a pleasure um, speaking to you and obviously anybody wanting to keep keep up with um, the album that's been created, any, well obviously for Australia, any gigs or that, you're on social media, they can give you a follow, keep track of where you're at. But I wish you all the luck in the future. And I uh, thank you again for coming on. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thanks, 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 Th